Hey everyone, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to try something different. This is going to be a real-time paint along watercolor tutorial. I'll be showing you step by step how to paint this ray gun using simple techniques including frisket and also a little bit of ink. So I have the reference photo included for you if you'd like to paint along, as well as a list of my supplies. You don't have to use the same exact supplies, but something similar would be definitely helpful. I'll be painting with a limited palette today using cool and warm primaries as well as a Viridian and a Payne's Gray. If you are new to watercolors or a beginner, then this would be a wonderful exercise to follow along with. We're going to be using basic watercolor techniques and mixing. All right, so let's get started. So because our ray gun has so much white on the actual design, we're going to be starting out by using a little bit of frisket to preserve the white quality of the paper. If this was any other design, we probably wouldn't be using frisket, but there's all those tiny white dots and stripes on the actual gun that would be very time consuming to paint around. So I'm just going to dip one of these silicone um, color shapers and they come in a variety of different tips. This is my favorite way to apply masking fluid or frisket. And for those of you that are not familiar with this, it's basically a liquid latex. And it, once it's dry, it'll allow us to paint right over top of our image. So just looking at the gun, I'm choosing any areas that have that white painted stripe on them. And I'm just going through with my pointed color shaper. You can use all sorts of stuff to apply frisket though. Um, those wooden skewers work really nicely. And it's not that big of a deal if you apply the frisket in an area where you don't like how it turned out. Just wait for it to fully dry and then you'll be able to use your finger to rub it off and you can reapply it. So the colors in this toy gun are actually not that complex. Um, the complexity comes from the inability to layer the watercolor to get that really sharp contrast between the white lines and the dark base of the gun. So by taking our time and deliberately placing the masking fluid to preserve those lighter values, we basically are just going to make it easier on ourselves when we begin to apply the watercolor. Frisket dries pretty quickly. You won't have to let it sit for that long. Um, normally by the time that I'm completely done plugging in all the frisket or masking fluid in my illustration, um, it'll be dry wherever I first started. It normally dries this brand, which is the Talon's um, liquid masking fluid. Um, this brand will dry a little bit darker, and when you run your finger over it, it'll be slightly tacky. There's all sorts of different types of masking fluid though. Uh, different companies make it in different colors. And as I finish blocking in the rest of the details with the frisket, I'm just going to talk a little bit about this space jet gun. So these are really cool um, antiques. I collect all sorts of different antique stuff, but I really like um, the 60s and 70s tin toys. And I have a couple different of these space age guns. These are really cool. Um, you pull the trigger and uh, it has a spark that goes off in the chamber and it's actually just a piece of flint. Um, but the little red plastic tip in the barrel of the gun also moves outward and inward. So it's just a really fun toy. Um, the box is really cool too. I don't have the box for this gun, but, um, I'll definitely show you guys a picture so you can check it out. 
I promised myself that I wasn't going to go on a tangent about the gun, so I promise from here on out we will just be talking art techniques and um, tips on what we're doing. And if you're not sure if you should be adding frisket to a specific area, just keep in mind that we're masking off any areas that need to remain light. Essentially, we're going to be painting a really dark color over the majority of the gun. So this frisket will just keep these areas tidy, and then we can paint a lighter color um, where the frisket came off. So like I was saying, something like a wooden toothpick is going to be perfect for this. There's just a bunch of really small dots on the gun. I'm not going to try to match that perfectly, and I don't even know if I'm going to add as many. But I do definitely want to add a variety of different sized dots, and I'm just going to fill in the majority of the space. Applying frisket is also one of my favorite parts of watercolor because when you get to remove it, it just has such a beautiful effect. Um, it's so useful. So, I think I'm happy with my frisket. Um, I just am going to fill in the rest of this little planet, and then I think we are set to go. Okay. Just going to go ahead and spray my watercolors, get those nice and wet. So, let's go ahead and start off with our biggest brush. You can go ahead and tap your paper to make sure that that's nice and dry. And what we're going to do is start blocking in the local color. Now the majority of our um, ray gun here has a really dark blue to it. So I'm going to be taking some of that ultramarine deep plus a little bit of the Payne's gray, mixing that up for a deep navy color. Now, because we have all this first skin in place, we do not have to be super careful about where we place this dark blue color. It can actually just go right on top. And you'll see the frisket or masking fluid repel your paint a little bit. I'm just gonna block that in. And you might need to make another pass or two just to make sure it really gets down in between all of those areas of masking fluid. Now this one area here on the handle is a white spot. Um, we're going to be doing some detail in there later, so I'm just going to paint around that. And this is a pretty um, tight subject. There's a lot of little details in it that we can choose to include or not, but the first step is going to be to plug in that local color, and that way we'll be able to figure out what other colors around it that we need to plug in. Using a big round to plug in the majority of our overall local color is a great selection because the bristles in this brush hold a whole bunch of pigment and water. It allows me to just dip into my palette every once in a while, while the point of the brush allows me to have really tight edges and lines. Um, I can really get in some nooks and crannies pretty easily without having to dip my brush a lot. Also, by having a large brush and that brush holding a lot of water, you're going to get smoother gradations in your larger areas, so your colors will be more easily, evenly distributed um, throughout the area that you're working on. And the majority of the time we work light to dark, which is why we'll, when we plug in our local color, we're going to do it in pretty transparent washes. That way I'll have full control over how dark and where I want to place my shadows, and it'll also give me the opportunity to include extra color and detail 
throughout the gun that I may not have the opportunity to do if I go too dark right away. Let's move over to this actual pointed end of the gun here. Now this is a very interesting aspect to this illustration. We're going to be using a little bit of glazing to make the green plastic look transparent. So I'm just going to use a tiny bit of the cadmium and the um, red matter lake together. And just lightly plug in the center part of the barrel. Now the way that we'll be able to achieve that look of transparency is by glazing the green over top later. The one part that definitely does not have any transparency is going to be right here on the edge. So I'm just drying off my brush and I'm using a technique called lifting. And essentially, you get your brush really nice and dry. And wherever that color, preferably still wet, is, you'll just come through with your brush and slightly glaze over top. And you'll need to dry off your brush in between doing this. I'm actually going to just do it a couple times here on the center to lift up a little bit of that red. It looks pretty strange right now. But after we get a good glaze of green over top, I think that that's going to be really pretty. So let's keep plugging in our local colors. We definitely have to do the trigger here. So again, I'm just going to use a little bit of Payne's Gray. And I'm actually going to put a tiny bit of the Azo Yellow Deep in there. So Payne's Gray, Azo Yellow Deep. Or you can just use um, a gray color that you have in your palette. And again, we're just going to do one single wash on that trigger. And using a limited palette, um, especially if you're a beginner, is such an important thing to do. It'll teach you all about color mixing. And no matter what you paint, you'll have pretty good color harmony throughout your painting. Color harmony will make your subject look more like it all belongs in the same place. Um, your colors will normally work together and you'll have a pretty successful painting. All right. So next I'm going to go back through over top of the main area of the gun here. And I'm basically going to load up my Payne's Gray with my Ultramarine Blue, make a darker value. And I'm going to just look at my reference here. And wherever it's darker than the color that's already on my sketchbook, I'm just going to go in. You can plug it in. Don't worry so much about the edges for now. Just worry about blocking it in. Watercolor is one of those magical things where you can always go back through and re-mess around with the edges. You can even lift color out if it's too dark. It's very forgiving. And I want my gun to be quite a bit deeper than I originally made it. So I'll probably go through the majority of it and do a second coat. And although in the photo um, it's a really deep navy blue, I think by making it a little bit more saturated in my sketchbook, I'm going to end up with a better product. Um, I think my illustration will be more interesting if it's a little more colorful. So I think I'm going to keep it a little bit more blue. And that's one of the fun things about being an artist. You don't have to paint it exactly like how it is in real life. Um, that's what cameras are for. So if you want to change something, you should. 
All right, so I'm going to go through, now that I've plugged this in, I'm going to clean off my brush. And just using a slightly wet brush, just going to kind of feather over that very edge just to help that gradation a little bit more. I want my edges to be soft, although they don't need to be incredibly soft. It's not like we're doing a sunset or anything. And I'm just going to continue going through with that ultramarine deep and that Payne's gray. And as I plug in these colors, layering over top of the previous layer that we placed. I'm thinking about my gun as having different planes to it and trying to consider the form as well. Why is this one area darker? How is the light hitting the edge of this bevel? Just all things to keep in mind. And we'll be, you know, working on this just for an hour today. So it's not going to be something that will be incredibly well flushed out, but I still want it to have a really beautiful look to it. So I'm taking my time where I think it needs it the most, which is definitely going to be uh, making sure that the form and values are correct on the gun. So I'm actually going to take a little bit of Cerulean Blue next. This Cerulean Blue um, is Cerulean Blue Deep. Oh, just kidding. This is just the regular Cerulean Blue in this palette. So this one is actually only going to be semi-transparent. Um, I'm going to plug this through the center of the gun. This is going to be one of the more highlighted areas. But instead of doing uh, that wider highlight, I'm plugging in this light blue and using a little bit of water to really kind of lift and apply the paint at the same time. What that'll do is it'll give me a really nice highlight throughout. And if you just focus that on the center of the gun there, you'll get that really nice center highlight where the light is just sitting right on the top in order to really push that gradation I'm going to go back through with my ultramarine and Payne's gray and plug in just the very top bevel of the gun there are some red details up there at the top um, that I did not use my masking fluid for, so they'll probably end up being a little bit darker than I want them to be. All right, so that's pretty much going to be how um, the colors in there are going to look for now. I will probably go through one more time and add my final shadows, but for now, this is what we're going to end up with. I'm going to rinse off my brush really well. And I'm going to be using this Lemon Cadmium Yellow plus a tiny bit of the Ultramarine to get this um, really bright green color here. And it is toned a little bit too much like an apple green, so I will add a little bit of the Viridian into it. I'm going for this really unique uh, barrel of the gun color. And when I apply it, I'm just going to apply it really lightly right over top of the red that we already have in place. And I'll just be ever so lightly moving that green around. This is going to be the base color for the barrel of our gun. So just focus on making sure your edges are nice and crisp. And as far as the actual color, you're going to try to make it as flat as you can. That will be the base color. So we can switch down to one of our even smaller brushes now. And I'm going to uh, establish some more shadow here in the handle. 
And I want my darker area of this trigger to have a little bit of a blue reflection in it as well. So I'll just add a little bit of that extra ultramarine blue right at the end there. There are a lot of different metal accents on this gun. And because I want it to have an aged look, I don't want it to be pred predominantly um, gray. I want it to have other colors in it as well. Even like a little bit of a muddy color would be fine. So the way you'll get that is by mixing your complementary colors together. While we have this dark mix, I'm also gonna go through one more time, plug in my darkest shadows. This is going to be uh, the last pass in my dark blue areas for this sketch. And I like to really bump up the contrast in um, areas, especially right next to frisket, because that way our frisket is going to have a little bit more of an extra contrast in it, and it makes for a really nice um, clean line. And I'm also going to take that dark shadow and uh, just hit the very top and bottom edge of this uh, wider area of the ray gun, just to make sure I'm really pushing my contrast. Let's plug in these uh, dark shadows over here to give this barrel a little bit more dimension. I'm just going to use the Viridian with a little bit of the ultramarine blue. I don't want to use any Payne's Gray or anything to muddy up the color because I want it to have that really bold jewel tone and I don't want it to be muted. So I'm going to plug this mix in uh, right here in the beveled area first. Now this is actually quite a complicated little section. So what I'm going to do is just focus on the darkest values that I see and go from there. And just like before, I'm going to just plug them in. I'm not worrying so much about my edges right now, especially when there's a lot of um, repetition. If you can just follow the same pattern, you can get a pretty consistent result. I probably normally would not paint an area like this if I was doing a more finalized painting. But because this is just a study or a sketch, I'm just going to plug it in. I'm also going to plug in that little green detail here. So while we have our darker shadow green out, let's go ahead and reinforce the top of the barrel here as well. So the goal is to have the tone that's already on the paper be the lightest area. And this new shadow green that we're plugging in is just going to be where the plastic overlaps So after we've plugged in our shadows, we'll be able to go back through with our wet brush and just lightly scrub over the edge. And what that's going to do is it'll soften that edge up. It's going to make this area look a lot more smooth, help with our range. We don't want everything to be either a shadow or the base color. So just by doing that simple pattern and going in with that darker green and just putting it in a couple different areas, we've added a whole bunch of dimension. It's a really unique green. Um, it almost has like a glow to it. Um, and what I wanna do is I'd like to go through with a little bit of this really bright yellow mixed in with just a little bit of Viridian. And I'm going to be placing that kind of near the top and the bottom of each one of those little bevels. 
and help push the vibrancy of this really playful green plastic color. All right, so before I remove any of my frisket, I'm just going to go through and paint a little bit of this chrome detail around the very edge. After we do that, we should be ready to remove our chrome or our frisket. And the reason I'm mixing my paints gray with a little bit of that azo yellow medium is to give it a little bit of a green tinge. Um, if it's too green, you can always add a little bit of that permanent matter into it. I don't want all of the metal on this gun to look like it's chrome. I want it to look like it's old metal. And when painting this, just focus on trying to make your line as clean as possible. You'll want it to have a really smooth edge to help uh, portray that it's really sharp metal. So if you need to go through with a little bit of Payne's gray on your brush, you can almost outline just the edge. And I wanna make sure that right where it meets the gun, I add a little bit of that extra black as well, or that extra Payne's gray. Right, so let's add just a little bit of some red detail while we wait. While that dries up, let's go ahead and fill in these little glass windows on the side of the gun. We're gonna use a little bit of each red plus some of the ultramarine blue to make a saturated purple color. I'm just gonna use a small pointed round brush to fill those in and I don't want them to be perfectly filled in. I want it to have a lot of variation in each of those smaller circles. For the rest of the details on the gun, they have a little bit more of a cherry red appearance to them. So I'll be using the CAD red plus the matter, um, the permanent matter red, mixing those together pretty much 50-50. And then I'm gonna go through and fill in those smaller details with the red. And they're really small. So if you actually wanna switch over to a liner brush, this will give you really clean lines. Um, I love line brushes because they store a lot of the paint in the bristles. So you don't have to dip your brush as often as if you were using a really small round brush. So I'll just fill in my dot red. And this has a couple different layers in it. Um, it has like a black line that goes over top as well. So I'll just let that dry really well before moving on to that black line. I know we're jumping around quite a bit today, but I wanna make sure that we have time to get to everything. If you accidentally brushed over an area you didn't want to, you can always use the lifting technique. Make sure the brush is nice and dry and just put it over the area of recently added watercolor and it will suck up that watercolor and leave you with that area underneath. Um, the area around our frisket should be pretty dry, so just going to make sure my hands are dry. And then I'm going to go ahead and rub the frisket lightly. And what that will do is it'll just pull it up. They also make these tools called pickup erasers. Um, they work wonderful as well if you have a large area of frisket that you're trying to get off, highly recommend. Um, but otherwise, I've seen people use things like um, kneaded erasers or even white erasers will work fine too. So lots of different ways to get this frisket up. But as you can see, we're left with a really clean, deliberate line. And now when we place our watercolor over top, we'll get it at its full vibrancy which is wonderful because especially for um, like the text area, it's that light orange. We didn't have to paint around it at all. And we got a really beautiful 
um, gradient effect on the body of the gun. I'm going to go through with my liner brush and um, use the Azo yellow medium. I'm not going to mix it with anything. I think it's kind of the perfect color. And I'll just fill in the entire um, letters. The red drop shadow will be easy enough to place over top once it's nice and dry. So these are moments of intense concentration. <laughs> just take your time and yeah, be careful filling in that yellow. It's really helpful if that blue surrounding the letters is fully dry. I mean, if we didn't use the frisket, then we would have had to paint around the letters. And normally painting around letters is a lot more challenging than painting the letter itself. Either way, words are always tricky within artwork. So don't be too hard on yourself if your lines aren't, you know, razor straight. I like to just consider it as a little bit of extra personality in the illustration. All right, so I have that all plugged in. While I have my liner in this color out, I'm also just going to plug in a couple of the details on the planet. And there's also some red details um, within the gun as well. If you did not apply a frisket to an area that possibly could have had frisket, um, there's a couple di different ways around it. You can add a white ink in to the, to the area with a little bit of extra color and it will increase the opacity and essentially make it into a gouache. Um, this will allow for better coverage. And we also have some of these vents up top here. I'm just going to dip into the Payne's Gray, don't need anything else. And I'm going to plug in some lines here. These, I want to give them a little bit of a curve. Don't want them all to go straight up and down. And the main thing is being able to refine your lines. So, you know, when you're painting something like a flower, it can have a really deckled, soft edge. But when we're painting something that's mechanical, something made of metal, we want to make sure that that edge is really sharp and clean, and that will help the viewer really easily identify what it is we're painting or what our subject is of. The top of some of these lines have a little bit of a red to them. And again, I'm combining my cadmium red and my matter lake. Um, the cadmium red is really, really strong. <laughs> it's a very um, overpowering color, so you just need a little bit of it. The reason that cadmium red is such a bold color is because of the pigmentation. It is normally a very high quality paint, but it also tends to be toxic because of the heavy metals. And then there's a stripe that goes around this lower area. This is going to be tricky. <laughs> Having a liner brush in circumstances like this will make your life so much easier. If you can just steadily hold your hand and slightly move your wrist, you'll be able to get a really clean line using this type of brush. If you're not confident in using a brush like this, you could always use a brush pen or some type of marker. The interior of this has all sorts of cross hatching in it. So let's just place some of these lines. I actually like to start off with a line that's going to be more towards the center. And what that's going to do <clears throat> is it will set my diagonal stroke for the rest of the lines. 
So I'll, off of that line, I'll just choose my width and I'll have to follow that pattern for the rest of the stripes. At this point, I'm not even looking at my photo reference while I'm plugging in this pattern. I'm just going off of um, what I've plugged in already. Try to imagine your stripes going through the pattern. Right, and then we're going to go back the other way as well. And again, I'm going to start in the same area that I originally started in. And just remember, especially with things like patterns, um, that for something like this, this is just a sketch. You know, it's okay if it does not turn out 100% how it looks in real life. If you wanted it to be perfect, I would definitely recommend drawing it out in pencil first, going over it in watercolor. I'm also going to use this red to reestablish my circle that we've placed initially, uh, especially around the outside edge. I do want my circle to be uh, pretty close to a perfect circle. And I'll even cut in again around that shape. It's kind of like a starburst. You can see how that liner gives you really sharp edges. All right, just a couple more little red details. I like that there are knobs and different things painted onto this gun. Uh, it's really playful and we can clean up all of that with some darker paints, gray. Just put a little flash of a highlight into those darker um, windows that we did earlier. And then we're going to add a little bit of a darker red detail on the tip here of the gun as well, just in the middle of the um, barrel. And I'm going to concentrate that right on the edge there and just do a little bit throughout. Wherever my dips happen in the actual barrel, that's where I want my shadow to be. And I'm going to follow through with a wet brush and just barely move that red upwards, just by lightly feathering over the edge of it. That way I have one really crisp edge and one soft edge. Next, I'm gonna go through with a little bit of black or Payne's Gray in this case. And with my liner, I'm just gonna clean up some of the edges especially underneath the barrel of, uh, or the tip of the barrel of the gun over here. I don't want to leave any of that flat white shape touching any of the outside negative space around the gun. That will really cause the gun to lose a lot of dimension. So I'm just taking the dark mix and doing a little bit of a rim um, outline on both of the edges. This will also allow me to get crisp lines, which we definitely want a bold crisp line around the dark metal. If you accidentally miss line, no big deal, just get your brush wet, lightly scrub over the area, and pull inwards towards the painted area away from the page. In this circumstance, it won't matter too much because we are going to be placing a shadow in that area beneath the gun. However, this is a very commonly used technique, so if you're just starting out at watercolor, this is a really important one for you. If you are a mixed media artist, like me, then you are definitely not afraid of something like this. It's just one of the few ways that you can fix something that's a misstep. I often will use white ink to clean up my edges around the sides of an object that's on white paper as well. I'm also going to use uh, this opportunity while I have the black in my liner out to clean up some of the graphics. 
So the graphics also have the small little lines around them. And again, if you feel more comfortable using something like a micron at this point, definitely feel free to switch over. Painting at this small size, um, I'm definitely going to smudge some of the details a little bit. Um, I don't know if I can paint two rings within this one little space. <laughs> And when you're placing your masking fluid, you can potentially overmask an area. Better over to under, though. You can just go through that darker surrounding color and cover up any extra you may have. And I'm just going to pull that darker color down. And that's the key for covering up an area, is to pull that darker color down and around off to the sides. All right, so there's still a couple areas that are looking pretty crazy. So I'm just gonna do my blue-black mix, and I'm gonna clean up the line right between this dot and the painted line. And if you really take your time and apply your frisket neatly, you'll spend a lot less time cleaning it up. And it may also help to do this painting at a larger scale. This is kind of a smaller size for something with so many details that has a lot of very precise, small, exact <laughs> geometric shapes on it. But that's also what makes it fun. It's always important to challenge yourself. And, um, you know, watercolor, you can always go back through and clean up lines, which is one of my reasons why I love it so much. And yeah, it's okay if you need to fix the edges of um, some of the graphics on there too. You can just outline it lightly. I think the planets have a little bit of an outline on them anyway. Awesome. So it's starting to get there. Um, one thing I do want to do is just ever so lightly disconnect these main stripes from the lower. And I'm also going to clean up my top line and just really darken that up quite a bit. Again, we want that really crisp outline to make sure that all of our edges look nice and clean. And that's what's going to give us that kind of sharp look. That same dark Payne's Gray mix we've been using with a little bit of extra water will also give us a clean line right on that trigger. And you can see how I striped over the shadow that was already there. Just use a little bit of water to bring it out. Just for that one little shelf of the shadow right underneath the body. And you can use a little bit of a larger brush to buff out the edge of that shadow. The smaller the brush you have, if you're filling in a large area, the more strokey look you're gonna get. So you need to use a wider brush if you want it to have a smoother finish to it. All right, so let's get some of those drop shadows, reds into the lettering. Again, just a combo of the two reds. And this is, again, going to be something that's a little bit more precise. So just take your time. And then we'll just go along the right side of the letters. If you do accidentally get a little bit um, where you didn't want it, no big deal. Like I said earlier, you can always clean it up with a little bit of white acrylic ink. And then you just mix that with whatever color you need to patch over. So for this instance, it would be a little bit of titanium white acrylic ink, plus the azo yellow that we used for the initial letters. And the slower you go, and the more careful you are, the less you have to clean up. Another thing to consider while trying to do very precise lines is where you're actually holding the brush. The closer your fingers are to the bristles, or the ferrule, which is the metal part of the brush, the more control you'll have. The farther back on the handle you're holding your brush, 
the less control you'll have. So try holding it pretty close to the actual hair of the brush. And just think about this red as coming in through one side, and it should sit on top of the yellow that you've already placed. That way you're using the original masking fluid area, um, and you're going to get a brighter red than if you paint directly on that dark blue. All right. So now that we've got that in place, I'm actually going to be going through with um, my liner brush as well with the cerulean blue and a little bit of Payne's Gray for this really dusty blue color. I'm going to be using a lot of water and lightly brushing this over the lower half of these vertical stripes over on the side. So the reason that we're adding a slight shadow to these white areas is just to help push the dimension of our gun even further. If we leave an area a flat white, especially with a white background, it's going to really flatten out the gun. So this is just going to help push the form and the shape of the gun by adding that little downcast shadow. Even though it's a highlighted white painted area of the gun that it will still have a little bit of a gray cast on it. This way, when we do deliberately leave white showing on the gun, it'll look very intentional and it should be the brightest highlights of the subject. That's how you're going to get really dimensional contrast throughout your piece. So before I add my black details onto the star down here, I think I'm actually going to clean up this star a little bit using a mix of these two yellows. That cadmium is very opaque, so you'll be able to cover over that pretty easily. And I'm just going to clean up the shape of the star a little bit. I'm a very gestural artist. I do a lot of really loose underpaintings and layers, and then I build up tighter layers. So when I do small, tight sketches like this, it really goes against everything I'm used to. So you probably won't have to clean up your star as many times as I will, but <laughs> here we are. Doesn't matter how you get there, it just matters that it ends up how you want it to look. I still think we need to add a little bit of red up here onto the main bullet area. So I'm just going to use a little bit of a bigger brush lay in my red edges with a tiny bit of water and just bump up that contrast even more. When painting transparent objects, I always like to start way lighter than I think I might need to, so that way I have full control over the range of color within the transparent area. Now there's a really beautiful shadow that's underneath our gun, and the way that I'm going to do that is just get a wet brush and start plugging in a loose form of what I see in my reference. Definitely want to include little details like the bumps for the barrel of the gun. That's something you're going to want to fill in right away. Be really careful when you're putting your wet edge right next to your painted area as um, if that area is wet, all that color will just transfer into the wet area. Kind of bleed out where you don't want it to. I'm then going to take a bigger brush and just lightly, with whatever color is right next to it, add a little Payne's Gray. So it'll be a Viridian and Payne's Gray in this area. Maybe a little touch of red up near the barrel. And then another little bit of green farther away. If there's any areas that are in the middle or don't really have any color around it, just going to drop some of that Payne's Gray in. And essentially, what we're doing is creating a really diffused interesting shadow 
doesn't have to be exactly like the one in the photo. And you see how I'm kind of breaking it up section by section? I'm doing that so that I have really good control over my shapes and my colors inside of them. The faster you get to an area and do the wet on wet technique, the more you'll be able to put different colors into it and manipulate them how you want to. And fill in that area with quite a bit of water and drop in some of that Payne's Gray. You definitely want this to be a more muted version of whatever colors are around it. Payne's Gray naturally has quite a bit of blue in it, so it's okay if it has some blue. We just don't want it to be as saturated as the gun. And you'll want to make sure that that shadow goes right up to the edge. And this back area of the gun has a really beautiful fade from a very dark to a pretty light area. So I'm just gonna use plenty of water to fill that in and then lift out on the lighter area. If you're nervous about placing these shadows freehand, then you can always go through with the pencil beforehand and sketch out where exactly you want your shadows to be. I like having the really soft edge and don't want to risk there being a pencil line, so I normally skip that step. So I'll just rinse out my brush once I have my color plugged in, and just lightly feather over the area that has just been painted and that should help lift out some of that lighter color. You can push your shadows even more just by piling up that color in the darker areas. You can add a little bit of a tint of a different color as well if you'd like. I find that it's really easy to put a lot of personality in a painting in something like a shadow. It's important to leave all the imperfections and all those fun different backfills and granulations throughout. It also really sets apart the actual bold coloration of the gun, and those shadows take on a softer, more playful presence, which I really enjoy. But of course it's a style choice. So if you want your lines to be cleaner and your fills to be cleaner, you can get the area wet again and lift out any imperfections. So I know our space gun has a little bit of red detail up top um, that I would love to plug in, but unfortunately I did not mask off that area. So I think what I'm going to do is go in with just a tiny bit of acrylic ink um, as my final step to just clean it up a little bit. In order to tighten up this illustration, there's going to be a lot of refinement of different edges that we're going to need to do, and also just blocking over areas with the acrylic ink mixed with the watercolor will allow us to add additional details into the gun. I'm just going to be using my liner, a little bit of that acrylic ink, and then whatever color you need. So for this area up top, just mixing the reds with that little bit of white, and then I'll be able to go through and just place that red back on top. Now, the more white you use, the more opaque your color will be. However, it'll tint that color, so it's going to make it a little bit of a pink. So what I can do is go through and paint a second coat on top if I'd like to. 
I'm just going to be placing that right on the actual barrel of the gun as well. Just put a little dot, get your brush wet, and then slightly play with the sides of the ink. On something like metal, we don't want it to have a super unpredictable edge, but um, we're just going for something soft and it will give it that appearance that it's just reflecting off the metal. Now, if it gets too light and it starts interfering with the design, you just use plenty of water to get rid of it completely. You may need to go into that area and darken it up before you place your highlight. And if you're looking at your reference photo and you see a highlight, but you can't place one, it probably means you just need to clean up the area a little bit. Refining your edges is one of the most important things of having a tight, completed illustration. So if you're working on your painting and you're not sure when you're done, my number one thing that I look for is edges. How do all the edges look? How do the edges compare to the edges of my photo reference? Does everything look nice and clean? Or is there something that I can clean up? Another good thing to look for is legibility. When you look at your painting, are you able to distinguish all of the different planes from each other? Is there good clarity? Those are just uh, some of the essential things to keep in mind. So this last, you know, couple minutes here is going to be just basically chaos of just jumping around the gun, trying to tighten up areas. So perhaps for this last portion of the illustration in these final minutes, um, I mean, you can definitely watch what I'm doing to clean up mine, but take a good hard look at your own painting and try to see what areas need to be refined. Just because mine needs it might not mean that yours does. If you're having some issues of clarity between the edge of your gun and your shadow, you can always add a little bit of a rim light. I would, I would not use the full white. I would mix a little bit of a color into it. In this case, I'm going to use the cerulean blue in my liner. And I'm just going to add a really um, sharp line right on the edge of the handle here. And again, if you have any stakes where it's not a perfectly clean line, you can always take a brush and just lightly rub right next to it. I also like to blend the edges of those rim lights out. Does not have to follow the full perimeter of the gun. But these rim lights are basically just the light reflecting right off the edge. And it really helps with clarity, especially when it's two dark edges right next to each other. And I always find myself getting carried away with rim lights. I want to add them on everything because they just, they just help. Especially something with so many lines in the design as it is. Um, I don't think that you can really go wrong with adding extra lines throughout.
All right, so I'm just going to load up my brush with that Payne's Gray. And this is going to just be a couple different shapes that actually don't overlap perfectly. It's like um, the atomic sign on top of a star. Again, great time to use a micron or something pen-based if you do not feel 100% comfortable using a brush. But again, if you haven't tried using a liner, I really recommend it. It's a lot of fun. You'll be able to get a ton of different brush strokes out of it that you didn't know you could do with a brush. Okay. A couple little black dots around it as well. And there's also some black lines that are like <laughs> inside um, of the actual plaid pattern, but I don't think I'm going to do those. So I'm just going to fix up just a couple areas that I messed up. So as I put my final details on the illustration, I just want to talk to you guys a little bit about this style of video. Um, if this is something that you enjoyed, please let me know down in the comments. Um, I would definitely be willing to do a whole series of different paint along objects. Of course, if you have any suggestions, please feel free to let me know. Um, but I love sitting down and painting and just uh, describing what I'm doing is so fun. It feels like I'm actually hanging out with people and <laughs> working on something together. So if you do end up painting this, um, please send me a picture on social media. I'd love to see it. I know for some people it's really hard to sit down for an entire hour and watch something on YouTube, so it's totally understandable if you prefer the other format of it being a shorter video. So yeah, I appreciate you being here, especially um, for so long. Thanks for hanging in there, and I hope that you enjoy how the illustration is turning out. Alright guys, so the very final step on this illustration will be to darken up uh, this front shadow here. It dried really light, and I probably just didn't put enough paint in it, I used too much water. So I'm going to go back through and layer over top, which makes me a little sad because there was some cool stuff happening in the shadow, but um, I'm sure that this will look a little bit better in the long run. So just placing that Payne's Gray back through there with a little bit of extra water, making sure to keep my edges really clean. And then I'm just using my brush to move that paint around a little bit. While that area is still wet, I'm just going to use that wet on wet technique by dropping in whatever local color is next to the shadow. Especially with that green plastic and the red tip, I want it to bounce off of the shadow. Alright guys, so that wraps it up for this video. Thank you so much for painting with me today. I hope that you really enjoyed the process as much as I did. For only having an hour to paint together, I think we turned out with something that looks really cool. Thanks for watching guys, and I hope that you have a wonderful week.